Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad that uh, you all can uh, log in and join us for this inaugural rainbow debate. Um, with voices being silenced in our communities, shouting matches and rioting on the rise, the public square has devolved from a treasured asset where ideas can be freely shared, reasonably and charitably heard and weighed into a growing battlefield of resentment and rage. The attack on the U.S. Capitol, the bastion in the exercise of free speech, has signaled this crisis. The rainbow debate tonight is the first in a series of debates that seeks a renaissance in civil public discourse. These debates will not shy away from the hard questions in politics, sex, gender, faith, family, and culture. They are intended to be a wrestling match of ideas and a helpful exercise in confrontational discourse. My name is Scott Fuller, and I've been given the privilege to serve as moderator by the invitation of our two guests uh, here tonight, or I should say our two competitors uh, in tonight's showdown, Rachel Rose Lucky and Donald Wilson Bush. I want to personally thank both of them for honoring me with this special invitation. And just a little bit about me. Uh, I am a Christian. Uh, I'm a husband to Renee and a father of five daughters which uh, I've presented as my strongest credentials as a referee for tonight's argument. Uh, over the last 40 years, I've served as a pastor and a church planner in Western North Carolina and in Northwest Georgia. During much of that time, uh, I've been committed to the education and welfare of children, especially those languishing in the foster care system. I'm a founding member of One Community United in Rome, Georgia, a civic organization bridging the racial divides and bringing people together from distinct and separate communities into a more united community where fear and mistrust are dispelled and peace and harmony prevails. As an active member of the Democratic Party in Floyd County, Georgia, I am socially liberal and religiously conservative which puts me way more in the middle uh, than what you will see in everyday social media. Uh, and I want to give you thanks, uh, Rachel and Donald, for uh, the opportunity to serve in this way tonight. And I look forward to hearing uh, from both of you. And before I introduce the two of them, let me express uh, our appreciation to the church in Ocean Park, Santa Monica, California, for hosting uh, tonight's debate. If you want to know more about uh, church uh, in Ocean Park, uh, want, or want to just give them a shout out and thank them, um, you might be able to find a link uh, on uh, this site uh, tonight. Um, if you're looking to, to sign on uh, to their website, you can find them at CIOP, uh, that's for uh, Church in Ocean Park, CIOP for the number four justice.org. Uh, and for those interested, I'm also aware uh, that this uh, century old church is currently holding a fundraiser to address some much needed repairs. Uh, they have this campaign going on right now, the Open Doors campaign. And so for those of you who are interested, uh, take note of that. Well, with that, um, let's welcome to the debate uh, our uh, contestants, Rachel Rose Lucky um, and Donna Wilson Bush. Rachel Rose uh, has served as president of her Los Angeles City Certified Neighborhood Council. Uh, Rachel Rose ran as a progressive candidate for Los Angeles City Council in 2022. She is the first transgender officer of the LGBTQ political organization, Stonewall Democratic Club, and works with the organizing team responsible for pushing forward a publicly controlled bank for the city of Los Angeles. Rachel Rose is also a member of the Lafayette, uh, a bridge home advisory council tasked with community oversight of one of LA's homeless interim housing facilities. And she sits on the LA Care Health Plan's Consumer Health Equity Council. Rachel Rose commented about the debate tonight, the idea of free speech is practically meaningless if it does not lead to a better understanding between opposing viewpoints. I believe it is possible to have debate in the public square without devolving into a clash of ad hominem attacks, resulting in hurtful insults. If Donald and I can sit down and tell each other our points of view without belittling each other, so can others. Welcome, Rachel Rose. And we welcome now to the debate, Donald Wilson Bush. 
Born and raised in the Scots Presbyterian tradition, Donald is a theologian by training and a political consultant by profession. He is currently president of the Woodrow Wilson Legacy Foundation, president and CEO of the Armenian National Association, co-founder and chairman of the board of High Coin Inc., and a founding board member of both Third Millennium Ministries and the Praxis Circle. In his private life, he is a registered Republican and enjoys reading, cartoon illustration, and composing with the guitar and the keyboard. About tonight's debate, uh, Donald said, for too long, modern day conservative white males have borne the brunt of today's cancel culture where our voices are being silenced and legacies trashed. This has led to a great deal of resentment. Moreover, cancel culture is just one symptom of a much deeper problem politicizing victims' rights. In an effort to make everyone equal, canceling anyone who is perceived to be dominant at the moment is unhealthy to the free exchange of ideas that is essential to a flourishing democracy. Welcome, Donald and Rachel Rhodes. Uh, both of them arrived tonight from polar opposites of personal experience. Uh, Lucky is a progressive tree-hugging transgender Wiccan who supports housing and health care as a human right that the government should run and pay for. While Bush is a conservative, cisgender, heterosexual white male, political campaign consultant, and advocate for the historical Christian worldview, which he claims gave rise to the Western civic tradition in the first place. The question that the two of them will be debating tonight is a conversation currently raging in chat rooms on social media across the internet. And it is this, is the LGBTQ agenda poisoning Western civilization or is radical Christianity the ultimate cancer? The structure and the format uh, for this debate uh, We'll begin with a 15 minute opening presentation by each speaker, followed by a five minute rebuttal from each of them. Then we'll have question and answer where audience members can enter their questions into the question and answer chat room. And I will present as many of them to Lucky and Bush as time will allow. And the debate will conclude with each contestant being given two and a half minutes for closing statements. Um, we mutually decided beforehand that the presenter would be determined by a flip of the coin, which coin I failed to bring. <laughs> Do either one of you happen to have a coin? No? All right. What's that? Oh, here we go. I've got one. Ask and you shall receive. All right. Uh, Lucky, will you, uh, since you have the appropriate name, how about you calling it heads or tails? I'll take tails, please. It is heads. Heads. All right. So, so Donald will be uh, our first presenter uh, tonight. And um, Actually, are we ready? Uh, to roll? I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, didn't we decide that uh, he would get to choose oh, whether or not he wanted to go That's correct. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. Donald, would you go first or would you rather? I will go first. Go? You go first? Go first. Okay. Sounds good. Well, are we ready to rumble? Let's do it. All right. We got on the left, our transgender Wiccan progressive. And on the right, we have our conservative Protestant political consultant cartoonist. Uh, so, Scott, uh, Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do me one yes. favor. Sure. Uh, when Donald starts, just go ahead and uh, stop your video and then sure. start it again so that Donald and I will be on this, you know, on the same. Uh, OK, same uh, level as it. I'll right? do that. I will move my video out at this point. All right, Mr. Bush, you're up. Yes, sir. Welcome to everyone. My name is Donald Wilson Bush, and I am honored to be a part of this important debate. As we begin, I want to thank Reverend Janet Golery McKeithen and Susan Logmiller and all the parishioners at church in Ocean Park for hosting this event and to Jay Scott Fuller for agreeing to moderate this debate. 
I also want to recognize Rachel Rose Lucky for her indefatigable spirit and straight up willingness to publicly engage with me in this important dialogue at a time when it seems that civilized debate is all but lost in this country. As things continue to unfold here, you will come to see that Rachel Rose is an extraordinary human being whom I have grown to love and to admire over the last four years for her brilliance and courage to make some of the hardest decisions you can ever make in any environment. And yet she has chosen to make them come what may. Now for the record, I absolutely disagree with much of what she believes and most of what she has to say. And I strongly disagree with some of the irreversible decisions that she has made in her life. But the decision to debate me here today is not one of them. And I want to thank Rachel right here and now at the outset for simply being here with me on this Zoom stage and to acknowledge her strength of character and commitment to having a civil discourse. Thank you, Rachel. I am grateful to you for this opportunity to lock horns and to present my views in a safe and civil space without being canceled or labeled as a white supremacist or summarily dismissed as a toxic masculine presence as I have been in other view, venues. This debate is all the more important in today's world because it also seems that rational and reasonable argument are nearly as rare as civil discourse. In the famous line by Eddie Dane in the Coen Brothers crime drama, Miller's Crossing, you're so smart, except you ain't. I get you smart guy, I know what you are, straight as a corkscrew, Mr. Inside Owski. Down is up, black is white. Well, I think you're only half as smart. And I'm not just casting aspersions on one side of this argument, I'm talking about both sides. No one that I have seen debating any of the current culture war issues on social media have explained where all this woke crazy actually started in order to give us some real context for building a plan to fix it. Everybody's screaming at each other and Donald Trump wants to hit somebody in the face. But all I can find is a bunch of clickbait without much real substance. For example, in the last two weeks, I've watched at least 30 debates and presentations on the internet about woke hot button issues like Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, gay pride parades, and cancel culture dating all the way back to the gay marriage debate in 2013 when Doug Wilson confronted Andrew Sullivan up through the campus confrontations between students and Professor Jordan Peterson in 2016. And then Ben Shapiro, who spent two hours on Joe Rogan's podcast in 2018, discussing the unfolding transgender controversies in women's sports. All of this without ever getting down to the root of the problem. During his podcast, Joe asked Ben two big questions that every educated person in the entire country has been asking. How did we get here, Joe asked. How did we get so far down this rabbit hole? But Ben never answered. He got close several times, but he never fully developed an answer or an explanation of what really started this crazy woke slide down the slippery slope into an absurd space where we are today with one Democrat governor having just signed a bill to teach second and third grade kids last week how to question their biologically nat natural gender assignment as part of the approved curriculum. A run of Democrat state and local elected officials who have already signed state ordinances and state legislative to create a third gender option gender X for so-called non-binary, transgender and gender non-conforming adults and children to present on all manner of government documentation, including government issued birth certificates. While on the other side, you have Republican leaders in more conservative states passing don't say gay bills and legislators voting to ban school counselors from recommending hormone treatment for adolescent minors with gender dysphoria without giving parental notification and without getting parental consent. Even when we had the relatively unrestricted format of a two to three hour interview with Joe Rogan to show us the roots of what this woke crazy really is, Ben Shapiro still resorted to conservative clickbait with one-liners and personal attacks on former Olympian decathlon gold medalist, Caitlyn Jenner, Laura Hubbard, a transgender weightlifter born with male chromosomes competing against women in the 2021 Summer Olympics and Fallon Fox, a woman's champion MMA fighter who never felt morally obligated to disclose the fact that she was born a biological male before she began brutally beating her biologically 
born female opponents. It will be interesting what all the clickbait YouTubers make out of this morning's news feed. Did any of you see, all, see the recent Fox News headline? It just came out today. New Jersey inmates at women's prison pregnant after sex with another incarcerated person. You can't make this stuff up, so I won't say any more. I concluded that these famous YouTube podcasters and elite media personalities to whom we look for serious answers to the important issues are only really interested in two things, views and clicks. Views and clicks, all they want is views and clicks. That's why they focus all their talking points on where we are right now down inside the rabbit hole. And unlike what I just did by moving on from the subject of breaking news, they just keep hammering their dialogue with gossip, sexual content, and salacious innuendo, and focus on who's doing what to whom, like Mari Povich and Jerry Springer do. Then their polarized supporters all hit the like and subscriber buttons at the bottom of their YouTube computer screens. Unfortunately, digging to the root cause of all this woke cancel culture crazy takes some real effort and some people might even consider it to be boring, but I'm not going to let that stop me from trying. And I'm not going to do this just because I want you to hit the like button. In fact, I don't even care if you subscribe to this channel or not. What I want you to do is to focus your attention and to engage with the facts of what I'm presenting here today, because this is not clickbait. Far from it. Forget about the fruits. I want you to look at the roots with me to see how this crazy woke cancel culture tree grew up so big in the first place. And then I want to demonstrate without any doubt how the LGBTQ agenda is causing it to grow bigger and bigger. You can disagree with my argument and you can question my conclusions, but you cannot deny the facts. As far as I'm concerned, understanding how we got here by looking at the facts is the only way to figure out how we can reverse the current trajectory into the possible demise and ultimate destruction of Christian culture in America in order to save the Western civic tradition of freedom and democracy that Christian people built. Not Muslims, not Buddhists, not Zoroastrians, not Jews, not atheists, not Native Americans or Aboriginal pagan earth spiritualists, and not Wiccans. But Christians, Christians built the Western civic tradition that has transformed the world with democracy, freedom, justice, prosperity, and security, and made it available to people from all other faith perspectives. Sadly, the current generation of institutional leaders, especially an increasing number of Gen X and millennial church leaders, are more interested in being liked and appreciated than they are in holding others accountable to the truth of scripture, natural law, and even science. Because these woke church leaders have abdicated their responsibility to pass on what they have received from those that went before us, social constructionists since the 1970s and the deconstructionists since the 1990s have been free to spin a utopian narrative of pure hogwash without any real pushback in many of our churches. And through most channels of the legacy mainstream media, in conjunction with the explosion of the social media, the resurgence of Marxist ideology is back in full force with all its destructive power aimed directly at the foundations of our great democracy. Boomers bought into it first, and then their children, the millennials, they bought into it second. And now finally, Gen Xers like me, who are kind of late to the party, are slowly starting to drink the Kool-Aid. Billy Graham's beloved Wheaton College has gone woke. Rob Bell went woke a long time ago. My good seminary friend, Fred Harrell, and former colleague in Reformed University Ministries has gone woke. And he took his whole San Francisco City Church down the woke rabbit hole with him. And even my oldest daughter's congregational community church in rural South Central Virginia is struggling with the LGBTQ woke cancer. Therefore, it is my contention that the LGBTQ agenda is nothing more than the latest manifestation and an organized extension of the socialist workers' revolution that began at the turn of the 20th century and ultimately took root in American universities in the mid to late 1960s as critical theory, feminist theory, and a host of other maladjustments to the academic curriculum meant to appeal 
to self-describe oppressed minorities who wouldn't pay the tuition if they didn't find their own story of oppression represented in the curriculum. As my Armenian wife says, Donnie John, it's all about money and new members. And I believe she's right. Universities will change their curriculum to anything that will get people in the door with their pocketbooks in hand. And it looks like more and more evangelical Bible-believing churches are starting to do the same thing. It's not about ministering to broken people who are legitimately suffering from gender dysphoria. It's not about that anymore. It's all about getting money and new members. In his book, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity, British author Douglas Murray calls the political aspect of this push for money and power the Marxist foundation. The Marxist foundation. This is the same Marxist foundation that we saw labor activists attempting to build their political house on 60 or 70 years ago. Apparently, it is still solidly in place, and the activists, not unlike my worthy opponent, Rachel Rose Lucky, seek to transform American culture into something new and beautiful by their own definition, by subverting, poisoning, and infecting conservative institutions built by my Western Christian European forebearers that support our bourgeois world of capitalist driven prosperity, ambitions, liberty, and free enterprise. Like slow dripping water, or like the proverbial frog in the kettle, these radicals, like yourself, Rachel, as nice as you are, you've been patiently infecting the American culture one community at a time, one family at a time, one classroom at a time, one vulnerable kid at a time, with cancerous Dionysian intent, like termites eating away at the foundations of a great house. As Murray points out in his book, this is merely an extension of the same old Marxist agenda that failed in other times and places, but still seeks, at least in theory, to bring down the patriarchy, or in other words, to level the economic playing field by homogenizing everyone into one large global drone society devoid of ambition, social status, and hierarchical distinction. I say at least in theory, because as history has proven, in practice, Marxism has only served to reinforce hierarchies of social order where violence and injustice prevail, even among farm animals where the pigs are at the top wearing long pants, walking upright and sleeping in the farmer's big house, while all the other farm animals still walk on all fours and sleep in the barn. As such, the LGBTQ agenda is part of this ongoing Marxist political cancer that started in the fertile soil of democratic freedom created and sustained by Christian love, philanthropy, theology, and social cohesion grounded in a widely shared, albeit evolving, grand narrative about how the universe works that was set in motion during the Christian European Renaissance and Reformation six centuries ago. But with the advent of identity politics in the last quarter century, this LGBTQ woke neo-Marxist agenda has quickly grown into a cancerous tree that is bearing enough addictive fruit capable of poisoning an entire generation of relatively uneducated consumers suspended in a perpetual state of adolescence who know the price of everything, but understand the value of nothing. So over the course of the remaining time that I have left, allow me to explain where all this cancer came from and in my concluding remarks, I will leave you with two things to take away from this argument that prove my point in this debate. Namely, the LGBTQ agenda is, point, is poisoning Western civilization. So first, where did this LGBTQ cancer come from? In short, Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century. But the long answer is, at roughly the same time in the late 18th and early 19th century, three European philosophers, Immanuel Kant in Germany, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France, and David Hume in Scotland, called into question any possibility of attaining absolute certainty about anything. It was at this point that Christian leaders in the church began to doubt the accuracy of the Bible, scientific explanations about the world, and the existence of absolute truth in general. 
This is what caused the woke rabbit hole to open up in the first place. In his books, Kant concluded that our knowledge is based on sensory perception and we cannot touch, taste, smell, hear, or really and truly feel God, the inner self, or the real essence of anything we encounter in the natural world. In other words, Mr. Wilson, we're Mr. Of Wilson your, your time has expired. Um, uh, so we've reached the 15-minute uh, opening remark a portion of your time. Um, so now, uh, Miss Lucky, it's your time to begin for your opening remarks. Okay, you may give begin. Me a, um, give me a second to uh, unpin Donald. Remove pin. Okay, there we are. Uh, you can see me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. I'd like to also thank Donald for um, for doing this. Um, I think that it is you know, clearly very important uh, for us on on either side of, of a debate topic to be able to hear uh, what each other uh, thinks. And I uh, appreciate Donald's uh, perspective, although I don't agree with it. Um, but um, I'll go ahead with my uh, written remarks. Uh, when I went to bartending school in my 20s, uh, they told us there are three things you should never talk about with customers, sex, politics, and religion. So, uh, well, so much for that, because God has helped me. Here I am about to talk to you about all three. Oh, but seriously, <clears throat> there are two parts of this proposition before us today. I will take them each in turn and then link them together. The first part is the LGBTQ agenda poisoning Western civilization? Let's dissect this a little bit so we can hopefully all be on the same page. The LGBTQ agenda. Uh, the LGBTQ agenda. So what is it? It kind of depends on who you are asking. But for me, it comes down to fighting for our protections, for our unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as promised in the second sentence of our Declaration of Independence. Plain and simple. As James Baldwin so eloquently said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. Well, for me, I will love you anyways because that is what Jesus called us to do. But at the same time, if you are trying to deny my right to exist as an American citizen, then I have no other choice but to call you out on it and fight you every step of the way with whatever I have at my disposal. As evidenced by the hundreds of anti-LGBTQ legislative bills either passed or moving through red state legislatures, radical Christian extremists are doing everything in their power to make it as hard as they can for LGBTQ folks to enjoy those unalienable rights. And no, the LGBTQ agenda is not about making your son or daughter gay or transgender. Like it or not, we are born this way. Books and teachers and support groups and the rest cannot make someone who is heterosexual or cisgender gay or transgender. That is a fact. The only thing we can do is to make sure that people who are LGBTQ feel safe and supported so they do not fall into despair resulting in self-harm. And that goes double for LGBTQ youth. If you are one of those people who say that they would rather see their son dead rather than gay, then one can only logically conclude that you need to reconsider what it truly means to be a parent. Believe me, I sometimes wish I were not transgender because life would be so much easier. I spent 50 years in the prison of the closet because society finds me guilty. But as much as I tried to push those feelings down, there was no escaping it. 
before I was, before I ever even knew about trans issues or LGBT issues or all that, I knew I needed to transition if I was going to survive. I didn't read a book. I didn't talk to other trans people. I was not indoctrinated. The only thing I knew is that I could no longer live a lie. Living that lie as a cisgender person was poisoning my health and well-being. And I knew I no longer wanted to live that way. Repeat, I was born this way and had no choice. And that leads me to the proposition, uh, to the proposition and the word poisoning. A poison is defined as a substance that is capable of causing the illness or death of a living organism when introduced or absorbed. The living organism in our case is Western civilization, and I would say that for a poison to be a poison, it must be harmful to the living organism. But where is the harm in inclusion? Where is the harm in making our society equitable to everyone? Where is the harm in loving oneself and other, others? Where is the harm of allowing people to be the way they were born? I am, I am sure that folks like Donald can conjure up any number of perceived harms. But I can say with the utmost confidence that anything he comes up with will be total rubbish. The LGBTQ experience strives towards inclusion, equity, love, and acceptance. And to me, that is what, that is about as Christ-like as one can get. Western civilization. This one is a bit more complicated to say the least. I think that when most people talk about Western civilization, what they are really referring to is white European fundamentalist Christian civilization. So when Donald says the LGBTQ agenda is poisoning Western civilization, what he, is real, what he really means is that queer people threaten the power structure that white fundamentalist Christian folks have cultivated for centuries and enjoy to this day. But when we talk about Western civilization in terms of the democratic principles of freedom for all, which, most, which, which people on both sides of the fence tout, Donald's arguments fall, fall very short of that laudable goal because at its roots, European fundamentalist Christian civilization has proven itself to be antithetical to inclusion, diversity, and tolerance. This too is counter to what Jesus tells us on how we should treat one another. Without those three things being present in our democratic representative republic, inclusion, diversity, and tolerance, there will always be division within our American society. Civil discourse should be the rule, not the exception for a democracy to flourish. Such divisions have already led to a drastic decline of civil society. Just look at Twitter and Facebook to see how uncivilly we treat each other. Isn't a civil society that is inclusive of everyone much more preferable than a society constantly at war with itself? Isn't a civil society much more productive when everyone is elevated? I certainly think so. And just to be clear, the LGBT community are not the ones who have been instigating a culture war. The ones involved in identity politics are politicians, preachers, pundits, and TV personalities on the right. They demonize any group they see fit, especially the LGBTQ community, in order to gen up fear, in order to enhance their grasp on power. This is as plain as the nose on your face if only you open your eyes and see the truth. Then gaslighting everyone, they point a finger at us on the left accusing us of starting culture wars, when in essence, all we are doing is defending ourselves against the constant onslaught of harmful rhetoric resulting in discriminatory behaviors, governmental policies, and legislation. We would not be looking to strengthen our protections under the law if you all would just leave us the hell alone. Everything the LGBT community has done and is doing is completely in self-defense. What we are saying is that in a supposedly free society and under the protections of our rights in, in the U.S. Constitution, you do not have a right 
to impose your religious value system on us. No one in this LGBTQ community is saying you have to be queer, but you all do say that we have to adhere to your interpretation of Christianity. And you are trying to force that value system on us through legislative processes. You are living in glass houses and you have cast the first stones. And one last thing before I move on to the second part of the proposition. We get accused of playing the victim as if we, as if we are not actually being victimized. This is another example of gaslighting that is being done. They say, oh, you're playing the victim card as if we are not victims of their onslaught of attacks. In my mind, this is a textbook example of what gaslighting means. Now, the second part of the proposition is radical Christian, is radical Christian extremism the ultimate cancer? Dissecting this, we first have radical Christian extremism. I define this to mean fundamentalist Christians engaged in politics and or terrorism to bring about a Christian theocracy here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. I am not saying this about all Christians, just those engaged in these activities. The ultimate cancer. Ultimate is defined as being or happening at the, at the end of a process and cancer defined as a disease in which some of the body's cells grow uncontrollably and spread to other parts of the body. And for our purposes today, that body is a free society underpinned by democracy. Here's the thing. Radical Christian experiments know they are losing the culture war they started. Poll after poll show they are outnumbered. Poll after poll shows their messages of discrimination and oppression of LGBTQ folks is not popular with the majority of folks living in our country. Their messages, their messaging has become so toxic that young people are leaving their churches in droves. You see, in a democracy, it is the majority who rule. We all know this is how it's supposed to be. And because these radical Christian extremists are in the minority, they are increasingly turning towards attempts at authoritarian rule. Authoritarianism is defined as the enforcement or advocacy of strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom. While these radical Christian extremists in the form of right-wing politicians, preachers, pundits, and TV personalities, as I mentioned previously, while they say they are all about freedom for all, they are lying to you. What they are really angling for is a Christian theocracy under which through authoritarianism, everyone will be forced to abide by, the, by laws that are strictly informed by their interpretation of the Bible. And they are willing to engage in violence as demonstrated by the insurrection on January 6, 2021. How is this any different from Islamic Sharia law? It's not. Why do you think these right-wing politicians, preachers, pundits, and TV personalities have been praising Putin? He is the epitome of what they want to see here in our country because they know if left up to an unfettered vote, the majority of Americans will vote against the Christian theocracy radical Christian extremists are trying to install. If allowed to succeed, this will result in the removal of the personal freedoms of a majority of Americans that do, not, that do not subscribe to their interpretations. The will of the people will have been supplanted. This anti-democracy cancer will lead to less personal freedom and cause pain and suffering to those who are on the receiving end of the discriminatory laws and policies they will undoubtedly put into place. So, in summation, the LGBTQ agenda is nothing more than LGBTQ folks and their allies fighting to protect our rights as American citizens under the Constitution to not be discriminated against in the areas of housing, jobs, health care, and public spaces, to name a few. We are fighting for our rights under the weight of continued assaults on us by radical Christian extremists who would destroy our American democracy and install an authoritarian Christian theocracy as a way in which to control the masses and retain power in an environment 
where their messaging of fire and brimstone is not re resonating with the majority of the American electorate. Radical Christian extremists don't want freedom for all. They want the freedom to wield power that is discriminatory against all those they deem as a threat. They are losing the unprovoked war they themselves started and some of them are now marching to the drums of an all out physical civil war. And this my friends is the malignant cancer that is infecting our Western civilization of democracy. And if left unchecked, our country will devolve into an authoritarian Christian dictatorship resulting in the pain and suffering of tens of millions of people. And for me, that is about as far from Christ's message of universal love as we can get. For love, for peace, for tolerance, for humankind. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, that ends uh, our presentation, um, initial presentations. Um, and now we will move into a time of rebuttal. Uh, each, uh, each of you will have five minutes uh, for rebuttal, and uh, we will begin, um, we begin with Mr. Bush, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. They corrected, yes. And, right. and you can go ahead and turn your, uh, your camera on. My apologies. All right. Well, first of all, radical Christian extremists are not the real problem here because they hardly constitute being considered a cancer on society by the numbers they represent relative to all of those that are Christians but are not radical extremists. And this is what we're witnessing right now. As you said, and you were correct, we are losing the culture war because it's not just a group of LGBTQs holding hands, singing Kumbaya, walking down Main Street. You're well-funded and you have a political agenda that is moving the needle in some key races around the country. And that's not what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is the simultaneous strategies that are being executed with ground tactics on college campuses, Christian college campuses, and within churches to infiltrate them and to take them woke, quote unquote. I told earlier in my opening remarks that my friends from seminary, my children's adult experience in church is witnessing firsthand what this cancerous infiltration looks like. There are kind of like where we were, um, we are now, that is the extremists, the fundamental extremists are where you were and your fellow LGBTQ activists were 20 years ago when you were just a marginal group of extremists on the other side of the bell curve. What we see here now is one side of the bell curve, your side, has now gone mainstream and you're moving the needle, not just in political spaces, with every governor dealing with the fact that they're either for or against your proposition, but pastors and teachers and theologians are having to make the decision, do I maintain the integrity of my lifelong historical commitment to the tradition? Or do you have a moment of what we call eisegetical subjectivity, where I'm gonna read into scripture and change my understanding of scripture to accommodate those people that I need in my pews to have members and money in my offering plate. This is calculated and it is working. And I'm watching the dismantling of not mainstream churches. They went in the 70s, 80s and 90s. We're watching community churches rural churches now dealing with this when in fact they aren't in the margin they're in the bell curve and this has to stop otherwise those pastors if enough go woke then we will not have any left that have any historical ties to the ancient christian traditions that gave rise to the western to the american expression of the western civic tradition
right, Mr. Wilson. Um, if you're finished, then we'll move on to uh, Ms. Lucky. Uh, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you, uh, Donald, uh, for those for those remarks. Uh, I made a, I made a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, uh, if you want to really go back to the uh, the Christian uh, traditions that you're talking about then you, you all are going to point to the Old Testament and uh, make sure to call me an abomination because I'm transgender and that I was born this way and I have no choice but to be. So, you know, if, if I'm an abomination, then, you know, I can't help that. God made me that way. I was born this way. And so, you know, if, if, if that, you know, from your perspective, that means I, I'm damned from birth. I'm damned from birth. There's nothing I can do in my whole entire life to keep me from going to hell because I'm an abomination according to Christian traditional religion. Uh, secondly, um, you know, as far as, yeah, we are well-funded. And why is that? Because we have had to fight tooth and nail for our like I said before in my opening statement, our constitutional rights and the, the story of Stone, the Stonewall Inn, that there was a, a law, a law in New York City where you could not walk the streets if you got stepped up on by a cop and you weren't wearing three pieces of clothing that corresponded to your gender identified at birth, you could be arrested. And that's what they did. They went into the Stonewall Inn. They took everybody that looked female into the bathroom to check their genitals. And one night they said no. And that's how the Stonewall riot started. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been the Christian tradition in power that created discriminatory laws against us in the first place. And so, yes, we had to rise up. We had to have a liberation, just like the suffragettes had to have a liberation, just like the blacks have had to have a liberation. We had to have a liberation. And that's what we have been doing. We are still liberating today. We only got protections for our rights to get married in six or seven years ago, 2015. The right to get married just like anybody else. So, you know, you could take that argument. I, I, really, I really don't, don't find any, any merit in that argument of saying, oh, we're well funded and, and you know, we're, we're infiltrating this and that and the other thing. There is nothing wrong with teaching American history that includes the history of LGBTQ people because we are Americans as well. And that can be taught from whenever you start teaching children American history. We exist. We are in society. And there's nothing you can do except for, like I talked about, authoritarian theocracy to keep us from being in the public square and being in public. And children and, and, and adults and everybody knows that we exist. And so a lot of questions come up, and I think that it, 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 it need, we need to educate people as to who LGBTQ people are, why they are, and I also think that in a more inclusive society, we would actually be putting government funds, taxpayer funds, into researching why people are transgender, why people are gay so that we can have a fuller understanding of our own humanity. Because if you deny me as an LGBTQ person, you deny my humanity. And that, to me, is fundamentally antithetical to the overall message, fundamental message of Christianity and Jesus Christ, which is one of love, peace, tolerance and kindness what part of calling somebody an abomination is kind what part of making somebody feel bad is kind none of it is and so 
what I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, woke does not mean what you think it means. You all have turned it into a dirty word. What woke means is enlightened, educated, facts. You know the facts. So therefore, you can make reasonable, logical conclusions that aren't necessarily based on a book, the Bible, which is parable and not an actual reflection of actual history. Ms. Lucky, thank you. Your, your time is up. All right. Um, we're now going to move into um, our time for um, questions and answers uh, from uh, our audience. Uh, we have a few of those um, that uh, I notice. Um, and let me adjust my screen so that I can field some of those questions. All right. Um, here is one. Um, here's one for uh, for Donald. Um, would you say that there is a direct correlation between cancel culture and violent protests on both sides, notably and specifically critical race theory? Can you repeat that question again? Is there yeah. a connection between cancel yeah. culture and those things? Yeah, would you, would you say that there's a direct correlation between cancel culture and violent protests on both sides? notably and specifically critical race theory. Yes, because we have a new generation that thinks the only way that they can make their point is to silence the other side as part of this tolerant society. Again, I made the point that most of the activists in the space that I've met are in a state of arrested adolescence. They they just live expecting the government to give to them, the university to give to them, their family to give to them. They're too young and inexperienced to have any real tolerance on their side. See, Rachel has the luxury of being as old as you and me. We're, we're Gen Xers. But what we're talking about now is a boomer generation that came in and said, we don't need to have any rules. Anything goes in society and their children that are now living that out and cancel culture for them is a matter of economics for whatever group they are trying to cancel. In most of the universities that I've been in where I've seen cancel culture work, it was the students that were paying tuition that caused the administrators, plural, to make a decision are we going to let these kids have their way? Or are we going to tell them, sit down and let's discuss this rationally? No, they just went ahead, met, met their demands and canceled according to the demands of the young protesters. So there's a direct correlation between cancel culture and all of these um, other protests. Uh, Scott? But, yes. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to, since cancel culture was brought up, uh, right. Like, yeah. Like a we'll moment. Let, you, let you respond to that question as well. Thanks. Um, look, as I, as I said in my opening remarks, you know, if you are trying to take away my rights, the protection of my rights under the U.S. Constitution, then I have I have no choice. You have given me no choice but to fight you tooth and nail with whatever I have at my disposal. Now, back when we were growing up, Donald, we had boycotts. If somebody didn't like a product or it was a bad product or something, we did boycotts. And I think that there's a lot of confusion between what people are calling cancel culture and just simply boycotting things and and shouting out that yeah this should be boycotted you know we, we shouldn't have to uh you know for instance listen to hate speech i shouldn't have to you know 
listen to, you know, walking down the street, I shouldn't have to listen to somebody calling me names, calling me an abomination, calling me a tranny, calling me all kinds of terrible things. I shouldn't have to as, as, as you know, living in a supposedly free society. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, with the word woke and this whole cancel culture, you know, the, the, the politician and pundits on the right, they want to gin this all up and make it more than what it really is. And what it really is, is us just standing up for the rights, for the protection of the rights that are, are enshrined in our uh, United States uh, democracy. Thank you. Um, the next question, i uh, put this for, um, for both of you as well. Um, uh, could you both please address how genuine community can survive if we privilege radical autonomy of individuals? Well, want me to go first, Donald, since you went first on sure. the last one? Sure. So, yep. Go ahead. Uh, radical autonomy. There's nothing radical about being autonomous. I think that that's um, something that particularly the, the right talks about is pulling yourself up by, by your bootstraps and, you know, being a self-made person and take responsibility for yourself. Don't take, hand, you know, handouts from the government and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I, I don't think being autonomous is radical. Um, what, what I do think uh, people are, are thinking is radical is, is having to defend oneself against the oppressive nature of other folks say that I shouldn't be able to be a part of society. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, being autonomous is great, but we also, you know, we live on the planet all together and we do have societies and we have the human society in general worldwide. And so I, I think that, you know, I, I think that there is a balance between being autonomous and being able to live with, with, you know, with each other in peace, uh, you know, at, in a society altogether. Uh, that would be my best. Scott, can you please repeat no. the question? Yes, uh, hold on just a moment. Um, yeah, uh, can you address how genuine community can survive if we privilege radical autonomy of individuals? It cannot. Sigmund Freud wrote his book, Civilization and Its Discontents. However you view Freud's conclusions, his structure and his interest in how we make decisions in communities was pretty spot on. You have rules that everybody must follow. There are stoplights, there's traffic going one way and tra oncoming traffic going another. There are times when children should go to sleep and there are times, according to different um, communities, when you go shopping. Radical autonomy is a utopian expression of a perpetual adolescent state. I just don't want any rules. I don't want a super ego telling me to do anything. I just want to be free to be me, and I don't want daddy, mama, pastor, or policeman telling me what to do. So the answer to that question is absolutely. You cannot have community if any one group says they are privileged to have absolute autonomy when everybody else doesn't. And if you give everybody the freedom to exercise absolute autonomy, you have anarchy. Okay, moving on to our next question. Um, let's see here. Um, let 
what is the harm? This was what directed to, to, to Donald. Uh, what is the harm to individuals or society of those traditions that you speak of about that are lost? Can you repeat that again? What is the harm of those traditions? What is the harm to individuals or society of those traditions you speak it, about that are lost? If they are lost, when they are lost. Well, th this is the, the whole point is that uh, I think it was Plato that made the distinction between the social and the personal, the individual and the collective, that we are both. We are both individuals that affect society, but we're also social beings that are affected in turn by society. So if we lose the traditions and beliefs, they can even be myths. In fact, I just finished reading Sapiens by Yuval Harari. And he suggests that language evolved 50,000 years ago as a means to gossip and to tell myths and stories, to weave narratives. Let's say that's true. Which one works the best? And it's a matter of historical, credible factuality. This is observable that only one faith perspective has ever given rise to a global civic tradition that protects the individual's right to accept, to reject, to ignore, to consider, or to reconsider all the other faith perspectives. And that's the T at the end of the coexist bumper sticker. No other faith perspective has given rise yet to a global civic tradition that protects the other person's right to reject their religion and my religion, except here in the Western civic tradition. And you lose that, you've lost your community. Um, first of all, uh, Christianity, uh, I don't know, I guess there are, what, a billion Christians? Rachel? Yeah. Rachel Rose, um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know if it's uh, on the mic or maybe a cord. Uh, if you want to is this better? No. Is anybody else getting it or just me? I'm, I'm here static. Let me, yeah. uh, let me switch uh, microphones. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me better? Oh, that's perfect. Good for me. All right. Uh, Thank you. So, first of all, you know, Christianity has not brought you know, world peace and is not uh, the end all and be all to the world. Uh, Christianity only represents, I don't know what, a seventh, one billion out of seven billion of the people that live on this planet. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I became Wiccan is because, you know, I, I got tired after Sunday school and, you know, assemblies of God. My, my grandfather was assemblies of God minister. I spoke in tongues when I was seven, you know, I've been through all that route. And what interested me with, with Wicca was that I was free to explore other faith paths. And I, I, I dearly love Buddhism, you know, uh, and and I, I don't think I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, but as far as, you know, a, a, a Christian civic tradition, you know, let's not forget about the Inquisitions. Let's not forget about the Salem witch trials where women were burned at the stake and they weren't really witches. Come on, people. You know, let's not let's not forget about all of the atrocities that that have been perpetrated by uh by by christians of, of the past and the last thing i'd like to say is is that when it comes to democracy the greeks came up with democracy before christianity ever existed and so if if there's and and they were pagans and so if there's if there's any 
you know, if we were to give credit to, to you know, of democracy to anybody, it would be a bunch of pagans. May I respond to that, Scott? Uh, sure, go ahead. When we say the Western civic tradition, what we're talking about is a system of governance and the possibility for a single people to allow their children to integrate their politics with their personality, their science, and their faith. And the Greeks did not offer that to their, their children. That is an ancient, ancient world and a, a worldview that has long been extinct. They had moments of enlightenment and democracy worked until Athens and Sparta went at it again, or when they were overtaken by another uh, group. The point is, is that what we experience here in the United States as a direct res result of, as a de direct consequence of, the direct effect of the cause of Christianity, not correlation, but as a direct cause of Christians working through the, the process of righting the wrongs that came out of the Reformation. John Locke had written his article on to toleration and our founding fathers were actually looking at that saying, wow, what can we do to avert another 30 years war? Because the Baptists are fighting with the Roman Catholics and the Roman Catholics are fighting with the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians are fighting with the Pentecostals. That's what the 30 years war was. It was regional religious, um, it was a, it was a world war, basically. It was a European world war where everybody was fighting with everybody else. And guess what? Those primarily Scottish, Christian, white, Western European men came up with a system that now provides you, Rachel, with the security and protection, equal protection as I have, to go on your journey and to try Wiccan if you want to try Wiccan. But the Wiccan worldview did not bring it. I'm telling you now, the Buddhist tradition did not bring it. And that point was made very cl clear when I was up in Ben Loman at a fire circle with a group of, of my friends' friends. And I made that statement about the freedoms that we were enjoying around that fire circle were brought to us courtesy of the Western cr Christian tradition uh, or the, the Western Christian faith perspective. This one gentleman said to me, I know the Dalai Lama and I want to, to admit that the Dalai Lama is a very, very good man and he is holy man. And there's some value in the Buddhist tradition. I said, I'm not arguing with you. What I'm suggesting is right now, if you were asked the Dalai Lama to take you to his boyhood home, he couldn't do it because Tibet is under fire. His worldview did not create, or so, I'm sorry, his faith perspective did not create a civic tradition that offers him the protection to even visit his boyhood home. But I can take you to mine and you, you can go to your, your childhood home too as well because Christianity provided that civic tradition. No other faith perspective. That civic tradition, when our founding fathers wrote the constitution, identified black people as three fifths of a person. That civic tradition created laws, anti-sodomy laws directly aimed at gay and gay people, gay men. That civic, that Christian civic tradition did not allow for women to vote. That Christian civic tradition did not allow black people to vote. That Christian civic tradition over the centuries has done nothing but to enshrine 
and to continue the grasp on power that white Christians have enjoyed for at least a millennia. And as far as the 30 year war is concerned, each one of those sects, sects of Christianity were not following Christ's message of peace. And I think that at the, at the end of the day, if I don't, if I impart nothing else to, to the people in attendance today and to you, is that we must go, we must go back to the fundamentals of Christ's teachings of peace and love and kindness. And until we do that, your civic traditions are meaningless. Let me follow up with another question here. Uh, this is one uh, from the audience uh, for uh, Don. Um, why don't you think that same-sex marriage is a legitimate form of biblical marriage? Very simple. It's not in there. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. And now what we're looking at is what I would consider to be a full-on Romans chapter one rebellion, not just against God. That's how I'd always read it in the past, but a full on rebellion, even against nature and natural law. I mean, as much as I can appreciate the courage that Rachel has displayed in her life to make the decision she's made, it is totally counter to the scientific reality of nature that having two friends get together and have consensual sex that is not of my business at all but to move to the next level where they demand that the churches that have bibles without gay marriage in them suddenly change and rewrite and go through gymnastics of what I called eisegetical subjectivity earlier, where they're reading into the text. And I worshiped at Metropolitan Community Church for two years, and I enjoyed being there, and I learned things about my own psychosexuality. But at the same time, I was amazed at the turn after turn after turn of just creating what I consider to be theological hogwash and then Matthew Vine did the same thing with his Reformation project, rewriting the Bible to accommodate what I would consider to be an adolescent state of suspension, where I don't have to make a decision about what I'm going to restrict myself from. And that's what I did when I left adolescence. I chose to limit myself to one woman at a time. Now, when I went to MCC church, I realized, wow, I'm a serial monogamist. I've been married more than once. But I owe it to the other that I will be faithful. And a few times, I didn't want to be faithful. But at the end of the day, I have remained faithful because that is what that faith perspective has passed on generation after generation after generation. And what I'm seeing now are so many pastors and teachers doing backflips to try to figure out how can I offer this ritual in this sacred space and call it a meaningful relationship with biblical sanction when it's not in there. You can't. Do um, you want to respond, Miss Lucky? Yes, please. Um, First of all, nature, uh, there are other organisms and whatnot in nature that uh, change from one sex to the other. There are uh, most famously uh, two gay penguins. Uh, so, you know, uh, no, that, that's, that's not an argument. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples in nature of same-sex attraction 
and uh, transitioning from one gender to another. Um, demand? Uh, nobody's demanding. Huh? There's no signs for that. They don't transition from one to the other. Yeah, uh, seahorses. Um, and so um, they're. Uh, seahorses are, are asexual. No. Like worms, no, earthworms. No, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about seahorses. They actually change uh, gender. Um, and so, um, and as far as gay marriage is concerned, uh, nobody's demanding that your church offer same sex marriages. What the demand is, is that if a church chooses to, um, to uh, you know, have same sex marriages, that the state, the government recognizes those marriages and issues a marriage license. And even without a church, gay people were denied a, a right to have a marriage license. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that go along with a marriage license, such as being able to go into, uh, you know, say, say your partner is, is injured and, you know, family only. Well, without a marriage license, their partner would not be able to come into their hospital room. Uh, their, their, their partner would not be able, to, in, the, in the case of death, would not be able to, uh, to, to be the, the, the heir apparent automatically. And I agree with that, Rachel. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, interrupt here um, and move on. I'm going to pose, pose one more question here. Uh, then we're going to um, move to our, um, our final uh, closing remarks. Um, uh, another one from, from our audience, uh, maybe both of you can uh, chime in uh, on this uh, together. Um, how do each of you understand the duty to love our neighbor when we disagree with one another so strenuously? Uh, I have one word for that. Unconditionally. I love everyone unconditionally. I may not respect what you do. I may not like what you do. I may think that you're making horrible mistakes, but I love you enough to let you do that as long as what you're doing is not harmful to others. And that's a condition. That doesn't stop my love for you. I love you unconditionally. Your tolerance. It stops your tolerance of me if I come in with a, a, you know, a gun, or I'm displaying, you know, what you would consider to be toxic masculinity. You're not tolerant of me, and neither should you. I'm not talking about tolerance. I'm talking about unconditional love. If you come into and and try to threaten me with a gun or whatever, that doesn't mean I don't love you anymore. It just means that I think you're screwing up, and I wish you wouldn't do that. But that doesn't, I, it's like, you know, I eliminated the word hate from my vocabulary. Oh, I hate spaghetti or I hate this and I hate that. I eliminated that word because it's toxic. I don't hate Donald Trump. I really dislike the guy. And I think that what he has done to our country is abominable. But as a human being, I still love him. I remember in my early 50s, I had a conversation with Roger Scruton and I asked him straight up, I said, how far does the biblical injunction to turn the other cheek go? I'm supposed to turn the other cheek to my enemies, pray for my enemies, love my enemies. He says, well, he said, it goes as far as you are able to turn your cheek without being forced to turn somebody else's cheek at the same time in the same relationship. At that same time, the same relationship, if you are in harm's way and someone is going to hurt you, you can choose as a free moral agent to turn your own cheek and to have them hit you or shoot you or stab you, but you are not free to allow them to hurt a child or a woman or another person that you are with. You are called upon to do violence 
I'm not, I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying that my unconditional love allows me to be put in a position where I would be harmed by somebody with a gun or something. And, you know, I may beat the crap out of them because of that. And at the end of the day, go home and go, you know, I still don't hate that person. I still don't hate that person. I, I love that person. And that is the essence of Price's message. Well, um, I want to conclude the, this moment then for our question and answers. We, we've had a number of, of, of questions come in um, in the last couple of minutes. Uh, we unfortunately don't have a whole lot of time to, to take those on. Uh, those questions will be um, uh, looked at uh, by uh, both of our speakers uh, tonight and, uh, and, and perhaps continue on with this, this dialogue. Uh, this debate um, moving forward. Um, at this point, I want to give both of you uh, your uh, your two and a half uh, minutes to wrap up, um, and uh, and so uh, we'll begin then um, with uh, with Donald. I said in my earlier statement that I would leave everyone with two thoughts and they are rather simple and they go together. The first thought that I want you to go away with is based in factuality. And that is that only one faith perspective in history has given rise to the global civic tradition that provides you and me with the freedom to do what we're doing right now, to disagree with each other, but it also gives every Muslim father who wants to stone his daughter or his child for breaking that civic tradition or to break that faith perspective and the restrictions of that faith perspective. It also gives him sanctuary and it gives the child sanctuary. Because when you come to the United States of America, you are living under the blanket of protection that was provided by Christianity. And no other faith perspective has done this. So I don't know where Rachel would want to live other than here in LA or in the United States where she's able to enjoy these benefits and freedom that she enjoys because there is no other faith perspective that's given rise to this except where it has spread from here after two world wars, democracy and Christianity have spread. Now, yes, there are those rare moments where you have been hurt by people that I agree with you should not be calling themselves Christians. If they call you an abomination, that's not loving. And I agree with you. But the second point I wanna leave you with is that this LGBTQ agenda, which I've seen up close and personal, is just as bad, if not worse now, than the radical Christian extremists because you've gone mainstream. And now you're not just satisfied with going to the Beverly Hills uh, Superior Court or the LA um, Municipal Court and getting a domestic marriage license. You're not, you're not satisfied with that. You want to take it and stick it to the local church that you think is calling you an abomination. And this is what we're dealing with now. We're not dealing with the abomination stuff anymore. You're winning the day. And if we aren't careful, the next generation will not have the places of worship, the teachers and the pastors that will pass on to them what they have received. And there's inherent danger in that. Scripture is very clear. Raise up your children in the admonition of the Lord and teach them the way they shall go and walk ye in it. It's a generational thing and we're losing an entire generation. And I'm old enough to be, you know, a Gen Xer watching the half generation above me, the boomers, and the half generation below me, the millennials, play this thing out. My question is, is there any redemption in the Gen Zs coming along behind? I don't know but that is TBD, to be determined. 
All right, Ms. Lucky. Uh, thank you, Donald. Um, those comments, um, what I'd have to say is, is that um, there's, there's more <laughs> under heaven and sun than uh, we could ever possibly imagine. And there's more to the American melting pot this American society than just Christianity. And I'm not saying that I am agreeing with your proposition that it was the Christian tradition that gave us the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, etc. cetera. Um, and, and allowed us to become that melting pot. What I am going to say is, is that that melting pot is under threat by people from your own party, from your own side of the aisle. And they continually refuse to listen to to, to everyone else who is trying to tell them that you are in essence destroying the very thing that you say you're preserving. If, if we are to become a, a peaceful within ourself, modern American society, then we have to be accepting of other people's faith paths, of other people's sexual orientations, of other people's gender identities, of other people's skin colors. And I don't see any of that coming from your side of the aisle. There is no acceptance. If you all started to do that and lay down your swords you would see us on the other side going forward in a way that is less confrontational. Because like I said in my opening remarks, we are defending ourselves. You all are the aggressors. We are defenders. And I defend my rights as an American citizen to not be hampered in enjoying my freedoms as enshrined in the Constitution of the United States of America. So um, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you. Well, that wraps up uh, our debate for tonight. Uh, I want to uh, just give a, a expression of appreciation to both of you, Rachel Rose uh, and Donald, uh, for uh, the courage uh, to come here. Uh, and to uh, express yourselves and to have this argument uh, together in this space. And to all of you who gathered uh, tonight in this virtual space uh, to participate with your questions, uh, to listen, uh, thank you. Uh, we all, I'm sure, coming from the variety of perspectives and places, experiences in our lives. Uh, but this is, a, this is an important uh, exercise. Uh, in, um, uh, in discourse uh, and, and, and the conversation that needs to happen. Um, so much of the public square uh, is being hijacked by, by those who want to sanitize it on the one side and cleanse it uh, of religious notion, of theological conviction, or those on the other uh, who would seek to baptize it, sacralize it, make it a sp uh, the public space to be something that is an extension of the church. Uh, for only those who sign on to the creed uh, or the formula of, of some cult uh, or, or ecclesiastical expression. So um, uh, this is important for us to move forward, to have this rigorous dialogue. And I really appreciate all of you uh, for moving the ball forward and uh, look forward to uh, the next opportunity for uh, rainbow uh, debates. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the, the church at Ocean Park, 
uh, for hosting uh, the debate. Uh, you remember, they are uh, having their uh, fundraiser. Uh, so if you'd like to participate in that, please do. Um, but that uh, does it for tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, be safe and have a peaceful evening. Thank you very much for attending. Hi, everyone. Bye.